I'm the type of person, if you ask me a question and I don't know the answer, I'm going to tell you that I don't know. But I bet you what? I know how to find the answer, and I will find the answer. All right, dear Eve McCord, it is, of course, Irish for a very warm welcome, my friends, to Shamrocks and Shanks, and another episode where we get to learn from some of the best professionals in the golf world. Now, my guest for this episode is Terry Rolls, who is currently based at Hudson National Golf Club in New York. As well as being a Golf Digest Top 50 teacher, he has worked with many notable players, major winners, former world number ones, and more than 50 PGA, LPGA, and DP World Tour players, amongst many elite amateurs. Terry's worked alongside PhDs like Phil Cheatham and Sasha McKenzie on his research into measuring the finding the grip in golf, and has also, alongside his colleague Mike Adams, developed their own system for measuring players, both from a static and dynamic perspective, that can help determine what is the best way for you to move and the best way for you to swing a golf club to get your optimal results. On top of all this, Terry has also been one of the leading coaches working with Sportsbox AI as an advisor to bring to the golf market the first commercial mobile 3D app for golfers across the board. So I normally at this stage give some highlights on what we discussed for the podcast, but I'm actually going to refrain from doing that and just really let Terry talk. I think this is an amazing insight into a growth mindset individual from a golf and coaching perspective. He's an incredibly well-versed, experienced, and dedicated individual giving his honest and detailed perspective on grip, movement, 3D, and so much more in the golf sphere. We do get into the weeds at certain points, but, you know, in my opinion, that's sometimes where the gold is buried. So, ladies and gentlemen, Terry Rolls. So, Terry Rolls, very warm welcome to Shamrocks and Shanks. Thanks for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate you making the time. And I'm sure we're going to come up with some great stuff that's going to help the club golfer, the golf coach, and hopefully anybody in between those two areas. But again, just a really, really warm welcome to the show, and thank you for making the time. Well, it's a great pleasure to be with you. I really appreciate your determination to help your listeners and your students, and you know that sort of uh, makes it easy for me to, to get involved. Well, thank you. I definitely appreciate that. Um, so perhaps for those people who aren't too familiar with you, right? We know you really well in terms of what you've done with Mike, uh, your coaching education, your work with Sportsbox AI, right? So a lot of these things in terms of very well known in the golf industry, but for people who perhaps don't know you that well, can you go into your background a little bit? Just, you know, maybe a couple of minutes, just surmise your kind of career to date and how you ended up where you are these days. Yeah, I'm a fellow, uh, fellow Celt. You know, I came from uh, Southwest England, Cornwall. Mm-hmm. Um, grew up down there playing golf and, um, you know, since, uh, pursued my, uh, you know, golf addiction by becoming a golf nerd, always trying to, you know, learn more and spend time with people who are smarter with than me. Um, and so through that journey, you know, here I am in New York, top 50 ranked instructor, I guess, in the U S, um, but very passionate about learning and trying to get better at things. And, you know, for, for different reasons, it's more like I'm a inherently sort of lazy person, I think. And, um, I try and learn things to make them easier. And yeah. it seems like, uh, other people like, like that too. So that's good. <laughs> yeah. I definitely think from my perspective, at least you're one of those coaches out there that are always looking to learn more, always looking to push the boundaries of what they know. You know, whether it's with your mentorship or your in-person courses or seminars and, you know, you're not just sitting on your laurels and doing what you always do and hoping to profit from it. I think that's really, really important. I think that's what a lot of other coaches, they're looking to learn from it. And it's really, really helpful in terms of both the student progression and the coaching progression. Yeah, it's interesting the different sort of types of uh, people are involved in golf. Uh, and I think it's representative of the fact, you know, there's lots of people who are, you know, people are different, right? Mm-hmm. And, you know, my style is very much kind of just a, a nerd. And I think you could describe it as, as more of a mastery approach. Uh, and not intentionally, it's just my personality. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so I'm always sort of striving to to understand better and think better and, you know, sort of thing. Make it easier is, is really probably my main attribute. Where, you know, there's all sorts of different types of coaches. Some, you know, like to absorb a system and just repeat it. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, each day I sort of reflect and work out where I could have done better. And that's where, you know, my partner Mike and I connect is that no matter what we do, we're always just saying, oh, it was pretty good. What could we do better? And I think that mindset keeps you interested, you know, keeps you alive. There's always a saying of, um, you know, you got to keep the well full, right? So coaching is a hard job, in my opinion. 
Mm-hmm. And people are different. We communicate differently. We have different goals. And there's a lot of things, you know, it's kind of like an iceberg, right? There's a lot of things under the surface that we can't tell. Yeah. And, you know, in every aspect, we're trying to get better, do our job better, and hopefully through that, you know, inspire some some people to some other people to get better and try and understand the game of golf and make it a little bit easier for for everybody yeah exactly so as you pursue your mastery in the subject and you interact with your students as you pursue that path you you can also help them along the way which is which is a nice way to be i think that's a nice goal to have and everybody benefits from that at the end of the day yeah i just Um, think from a coaching standpoint uh you know if you're giving out you know every day you know you have to have, have something which sort of refills the the well as i said before mm-hmm. i think it's a it's almost like an essential aspect or mentality of somebody who's going to coach for a long time is to to think like that because you know just regurgitating or repackaging and things like this it, you know sort of for me that would be relatively unsatisfying so i'm always trying to just understand a little bit more yeah it's it's a journey um let's get into some information for the club golfer um and we'll start off in my opinion, the golf industry as a whole seems to be, or appears to be at least, shifting away from some more anecdotal theories as technology improves and we learn more. Um, what are some common misconceptions that you come across from players on your tee? So some things that may have been believed to be true 10, 15 years ago that were starting to unwind and getting to know that maybe not the case now anymore. I think it's pretty common knowledge that... Uh people swing differently. I think uh, it's been a very interesting decade. We could almost call the, you know, the nineties and the two early two thousands, maybe like the, the lost generation at some level, because people were looking at videos of swings. Yeah. And, you know, you, you have to understand it's obviously everything is outcome oriented. Right. And so I say this and I probably don't mean it in the nicest possible way is that when people, approach the game in an abstract way um you know it doesn't necessarily make them better at golf and so for example placing you know i would say jack nicholas is the all-time genius of this that he knew what he needed to do to create results in a results oriented business now obviously there's a question of how efficient these approaches are but uh i think people try and make their swing look better or you know try and get the club down the toe line you know, any kind of unifying or homogenizing, homogenizing sort of theory of how it should look is already abstract of the game in some way. Interesting when you look at things like tennis, I mean, they're not like rebuilding their swing every three weeks, um, you know, but they'll practice skills, right? And so there's all these sort of crossovers in the game where I'd say uh, now more than in 2000, we are appreciative that there's a way for people to play um, good enough golf uh, with different looking swings, which is easy to say. Now, deciding which of those swings is good is a is a obviously is a step above that. Um, but you know, if somebody were to sort of go back and think about just simple questions like when did I play my best golf? What were some of my best feels? You know, or, or what kind of situations helped me hit it better? Downhill, uphill, things like this. There's there's all sorts of clues from their good stuff that doesn't involve them looking at their swing compared to Nick Faldo, you know, 1989. And so, you know, they can sort of get some clues as to what their style might be. Um, Of course, we got a book coming out about that soon. I hope. (laughs) There you go. Nice little plug. I think, I think I like that idea. Like when I get on the lesson team and I have someone in front of me and there's a video involved, I always say to them, all right, well, this is, in my opinion, a lot of club players processes, look at the video first and then, work back towards the ball flight rather than opposed to looking at the ball flight first and then maybe the end kind of or the last bastion really or the last placement is the video and the aesthetics. Um, so when players, I, I really like that question you said earlier on, when was the last time you played really great golf? What were you thinking? What was the feels? And that's all we're looking for. We're looking for the best blueprint for each individual. And if we can find that, it's a medley of everything and create all these, I don't want to use that term matchups, but in essence it is a little bit, um, rather than as you said, hey, we all got to look like this or do this or, or kind of perform like this. Yeah, so I'd say that would be the first answer is, uh, you know, I think that's been the, you know, kind of the launch monitor generation is that we can have people that uh, come out. I always think back that Hovland, Wolf, and Morikawa all kind of came out at the same time. 
and you know very different looking swings and they were mm -hmm. very successful very quickly but they may not have been allowed to do that you know 20 years ago because they they all have some unusual characteristics um relative to to the norm right and so so that's kind of interesting i think if we you know just raise the question as okay that doesn't look right well is there a successful player who looks like that well yes there is and that's already raises doubt about your philosophy that you know i should look like somebody you know choosing which player to look like is a different question but um yeah you know just that that fact that you can look at different styles of swings and and maybe pick up some some insight as to swing how to swing like someone who's more closely aligned to your personal body movement styles for example yeah for sure i, I remember talking to chris como some years ago and I was bouncing a few theories off him in terms of the golf swing and he just suggested to me, you know, if you have a theory about a certain pattern or sort of movement, rather than as opposed to looking for players that support your theory, look for players that are very functional but do the complete opposite. And if you find those players that are doing the exact opposite of what you think should happen and they're still making it work, then maybe go back to the drawing board and, and reassess your thoughts or your concepts. So one of the core aspects of golf is how we put the hands on the handle of the golf club. So how we grip the club and Considering it's the sole connection to the club, one might expect it to be a bigger focal point than it is, both in kind of coaching and in social media. How do you view the grip functionally? And can you elaborate on how you see the grip affecting the golf swing? How long have you got? <laughs> That's what I was about to say. There's a limit on this. Um, well, in terms of I mean, how, a, how a club golfer perceives it, because it's, it's, it's in, my, in my experience, quite far down the list. And yeah. there's, a, there's an apprehension, too, to change it, really, from club golf, or nearly a stigma attached to it sometimes. Yeah. Um, so this is actually how Mike and I um, came to work together, is that I had been doing some research on how the grip affects the, the swing. Um, and so it was, you know, using 3D motion capture and launch monitor and what have you to to understand if you change someone's grip you know what sort of things are changing and basically you know there's a lot of things that can change i mean i just posted on instagram this week you know that uh Schaffler had been clearly you know diligently practicing his grip mm -hmm. and as a consequence his you know his sort of tilts had evolved over time right and so i think um you know there's just there's so many like continuums in this answer so yes. one is a question of time, right? So if you were to change your grip, okay, your swing will change over time. That mm -hmm. that's that's a fact. Because yeah, anyway. Uh whereas if you look at it over a very short period of time, it might feel uncomfortable because it's different, right? And so most people don't really get past the short period of time. Um then functionally, you know, the question is to ask yourself if you have any kind of opinion about a golf grip first is what is a golf grip because if you ask you know anybody to define clearly a golf grip in a fashion which pretty much everybody can agree with you're already kind of in the quicksand right so nobody can really do that very effectively without being extremely vague you know so well what is a golf grip well that's how we connect to the club so like, okay great so how do we even talk about different ones you know so okay we're going to talk about different ones well the orientation okay fine well, we also got like palms or fingers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, wrist orientation, like high hands, low hands, distance from the ball. They all sort of have an effect, right? And so, so you can go into it and say, well, there's different combinations as well. You know, we got strong, strong, weak, weak, you know, whatever you want to call it. So I, I, I'm working hard on the book and basically, you know, you can put nine grips into a chart and say, well, you can have some combination of strong, strong, weak, weak, neutral, neutral, you know, and everything else in between. And so do I, to answer my own question is like, okay, so we were doing research and, you know, Phil Cheatham and I had a good discussion and worked out how to define the golf grip. And it's a relationship between the, the kind of the palms of the hands, you know, as a number and the club face, right? And so the club face is actually part of the grip, which is why it's uh, super interesting to watch Schaffler create his grip because he's clearly paying attention to where the club is. Yeah. So, so then you go, well, uh, well, how do you decide, you know, which one of those nine grips we're going to do? And so, you know, for us, obviously we, we test and, you know, effectively, obviously the hands are connected to the club, which is, 
already the first reason why you should be really interested in um, a grip because it's the obviously it's the the thing that connects to the thing that hits the ball. And then you go well above that we've got you know forearm rotation and we've got you know potentially internal and external rotation but also retraction of the shoulder and some combination of all of those. And so you know for us we test and effectively we come up with three categories which is you know when somebody's elbow pulls back like jack nicholas you know their hand effectively is going to be you know more on top of the club so we call it on top uh some people rotate you know more like kind of adam scott or xander chauffle uh dustin johnson you know Mm -hmm. so they'd be more of an undergolf where their hand ends up under and their elbow stays much more in front and so you say, well, what does that mean? So, well, there's a natural movement pattern associated with it. So when we say under on top, uh, people jump to the conclusion we're only talking about the grip, but it's much more kind of a movement pattern style, right? And so some people, they create energy by rotating their forearms, but their elbows stay in front of their rib cage. Mm-hmm. You know, Dustin Johnson, Adam Scott. But then you've got someone like Jack Nicholas, Roy McIlroy, you know, where their elbows go behind their shirt seam, actually Hogan. And when they come down, their elbows more beside them and they're you know squaring through more of extension style versus yeah. a rotation style. So you know, so let's say people have a natural movement pattern, but the grip also causes a movement pattern, right? So the grip is for us, it's a, it's a whole bunch of stuff. It's like the orientation of the body. You can set up like a K. It's going to give you a more of an under trail hand situation where the elbow is more under, or yeah. a T where you're more level. It's kind of where Scotty Scheffler has progressed to, and the just the orientation of the body, we call it sway gap. So you're tilted to the right or more level. That changes mm-hmm. your joints, positions, right? And so your yeah. grip and the orientation of your body changes your elbows. It changes your wrists and forearms and things like this. So so basically, how you take your grip orients your joints in a different direction, which has an effect on the trajectory of the, the club on your hands and the arms. And so if you're you know, trying to change the way that someone's elbow is working or the way their hand path trajectory is working, and you're choosing not to 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 talk about or deal with the grip, then it's really, you know, um, putting lipstick on a pig, I think they say in Ireland. <laughs> and uh, and you're just not going to achieve it as a, as a, you know from a from a long term um, standpoint. And what's interesting is, you know, we obviously see a lot of people teaching and they're reluctant to change the grip. But if they are adamant in forcing this swing change, then the grip eventually migrates to where it works, right? And so there's very famous people that have um, chosen to hit up on the ball more than their maybe their peak golf would uh, have suggested in their grip and posture and things have changed to accommodate it. And so, you know, it's a whole system of systems. But basically, in our opinion, you know, we, we like to to have the hands move to a place where they facilitate the type of movement that you're looking at and we very much work back obviously from the d plane and understanding how to deliver the club properly Mm -hmm. uh but then you know if you look at the whole sort of improvement process you know trying to make this relevant for a, a club golfer you know and nowadays club golfers are pretty uh sophisticated they have you know simulators at home and things like this so if you start looking at things like, you know, why does the ball do what it does? Well, you know, you've got like your base angle and your path, but mm-hmm. that doesn't entirely uh, respect like the three-dimensional nature. And so some people can have a good face to path, but, you know, their handle gets really high or, you know, something relatively inefficient is happening. And so, you know, when you look at the way people take lessons, they say, well, I'm hooking it, I'm pushing it, whatever. And there could be any number of layers that have contributed to that. And I would say as an average uh, club player, usually people don't grip it in a way that naturally squares the face at the right time. So therefore they have to add some adaptation to square the face. That probably is some kind of restriction, you know, maybe a chicken wing or they falling mm-hmm. back or whatever. And then they add something to that. So while the chicken wing makes the ball go to the right, you know, let me close the face at address. Yeah. You know, oh, now the ball goes low. Let me fall back. You know, mm-hmm. so so if you're trying to only keep it simple and do one thing, sometimes that actually makes it more complicated because most people have got this sort of house of cards that somehow works. 
Yeah. And if you change, if you regress, it's really hard. And so just to come back to where does this relate to the, que grip, the question about the grip? And so what we do is we test people and then we go behind all of that stuff and we match up their movement patterns first before they hit another ball and try and build from, you know, their movement patterns out as opposed to hook, low shot, slice, chunk, you know, all that unwinding backwards, mm -hmm. you know, which is, you know, very much sort of outcome backwards teaching where for us, if we can sort of line the joints up correctly, which includes the hands, you know, handle height, distance from the ball, you know, the elbows, you know, more on the ribs, or are they more, you know, sort of relaxed? Um, you know, so there's a whole bunch of things that if you can organize them. So what we try to do is we try to get the grip and the arms and the setup posture organized so that if the person has a relatively uncomplicated, you know, swing, we, we try and increase, increase their freedom of motion at that point, then technically it should work because as we go back to the D plane and trying to square the face and things like that, the biggest contributing factor to squaring the face is the grip and the organization yeah. of the setup relative to it. And if you can grip it relatively well, then you can start to unrestrict your swing and you don't have to have these, you know, downstream sort of redirections and face openers and breaks and, you know, path shifters and things like this that potentially make it a much more physical game than, than it probably should be. And that's where injuries kind of come from. So long story short, grip, face, you know, sort of, and the associated body positions um, yes. make life a lot easier. If uh, somebody were to just go way back behind all of their stuff, work out what is an ideal sort of hand and setup orientation for them, and then, you know, test themselves, uh, you know, probably the magic words are uh, fuck it, you know, when we play golf. You play the first few holes, yeah. and then you go... God, just fucking hit it. And then you relax yeah. and swing normally. Yeah. Well, that kind of swing is the one you need to go out with and not start, you know, after four holes or something. So, you know, just uh, Mike calls it the golf enema. If you can have someone to grip it decently and then do sort of three, four, five swings in a row where they can untangle some of their joints, that then there's normally really extremely profound changes that happen with very few uh, swing thoughts. So it's a long answer, but for yeah. us, it's uh, it's very hard to teach effectively without you know somebody's grip and setup position sort of matching how they will move naturally because then you don't mm -hmm. really have to change the swing very much yeah and you know i i find myself talking a lot about hand eye coordination if your hands are organized in a way that's sort of you know a little bit more natural for you uh then you have more time and awareness of where your body and hands are in space and that really helps your uh coordination i talked to mark bull a week ago about learning and, and developing your own skills and you know where you want to go and a phrase he always used is how good do you want to be and i think when you're looking at the best they're going to have to go into more detail and have to have more explanation so i'd never apologize for having more detail in your answers and when you reference you know scotty scheffler it's obviously very well known now that he uses a molded grip to warm up quite a lot so maybe that's an area that some amateur players could explore i think also when you're talking about the grip you know, from what you're saying, it's not as simple as, oh, if I'm slicing it, make it stronger. Or if I'm hooking it, make it weaker. There's a lot more that happens when you do those things. So when you change how those hands sit on the golf club, there's a whole kind of variety, of, so to speak, of knock-on effects. You know, for example, if I strengthen that lead hand, that lead shoulder is going to get a little higher. Maybe the handle might be pushed a little further forward. So a lot of things behind the scenes, so to speak. So if you are exploring grip, make sure you have maybe a little bit more detail behind it before you go exploring it. One of those nice things I noticed you mentioned there was the eye-hand coordination. And it's something that probably doesn't get mentioned a whole lot, to be honest with you, uh, but could be a nice area for players to look at some skill development tasks or some drills. Do you have any nice tasks or drills that you like to give to players in terms of developing that eye-hand coordination? I had a business breakfast the other day, and there's two guys, and one was uh, asking me a lot of questions. And not having tested him, I was kind of answering him like an encyclopedia, right? Yeah. And so he asked all these questions, like all these theories about golf and this and that. And so after like uh, 20 minutes or something, he's like, well, I don't know how that's going to make me better at golf. And I said, well, you didn't ask that question. You know, you asked a bunch of swing questions. I said, for example, my friend here, uh, you know, John, I've tested him and I've seen him swing. And probably the best thing that he could possibly do 
is, you know, go on the chipping green, hit a few chips, whatever, but mm-hmm. flick the balls off with his left and right hand, right? So he's learning a movement skill. Like, so, you know, talking about, you know, theories of uh, what recreational golfers can learn. Mm-hmm. Well, if you grip it decent and, you know, have a decent sort of setup posture, then you can allow your hands to work, right? And so that would be a huge misconception because, you know, our hands are at access, you know, to the outside world and we have a tremendous, uh, you know, connection from our brain to our hands. And, you know, quite often the hands are just, you know, unfairly blamed for uh, uh, hitting bad shots when potentially the body is in the wrong position or something like this. It's kind of like throwing, right? You, you kind of step, twist, extend your arm and then throw. So you're, you're using your hand. Yeah. And it's throwing, you know, if you're an elite level thrower, you're throwing a hundred miles an hour or something accurately. Mm-hmm. But the purpose of the step and the twist and all that stuff is to put your, your hands in a place where you can use them. Right. And it's the same in the golf swing. If you're not, um, you know, matched up, you know, if you're not in the right place at the right time, your hands are going to cause the face to, well, they're part of the process where the face is not in the right position. Yeah. But locking the wrists and locking the hands down is, is definitely not a solution. So, so that'd be a fun one, I think. It's just, you know, if ever you go practice, yeah. just flick a few balls. Perfect. Um, you know, I have this, you know, trying to add some stuff to the book. It's like we have, uh, you know, nine swings, nine grips. And beyond those, you know, setup and swing shape, you know, power generation variables, which need to sort of line up for someone to be able to go to the next level. We also have general skills, right? So, you know, if you look at things like sequencing or balance or speed, or Mm -hmm. these are non-specific sort of things that as somebody moves from like a 30 handicap to a zero, you know, they, they improve their movement skills on the way. Right. And obviously there's some specific to golf uh, movement skills, but there's some general coordination skills as well. And so that one is a big one. So for example, Mm -hmm. flicking, but yeah. you know any any level of disassociation, right? So things like hitting with your feet together, so you're swinging your arms, and they're not necessarily locked onto your chest, right? Yeah. Or you know just anything which is encouraging uh, disassociation. So you know, in a slightly more complicated way, we've over the years talked about kinematic sequence, which is sort of the rotational sequence of how the person moves in the golf swing. But in order for that to work, there needs to be a disassociation, right? If you look at a poor thrower, you know, their body sort of, their yeah. arm are locked together. If you look at a poor golfer, they're gripping in such a way that their wrist can't move. And then they're using their body to sort of steer the club face or, you know, try and hit the ground in the right place, which is very difficult. And so anything which sort of enables you to disassociate body parts is uh, is very important if you then intend to have like a throwing sequence. It doesn't just emerge because someone says, oh, you should sequence your swing better. They're yeah. actually like movement sequences. And that's why, you know, for me, like the best golfers usually are like to teach as, as people that have pitched, you know, in baseball, like pitching. So they have a throwing sequence, plus they have a, a target orientation. And so yeah. that's a lot easier than say a, a hitter in baseball who potentially has a good sequence, but they didn't have quite as much of a power generation and target outcome to their game. So people can bring that into golf, but generally, uh, you know, golf is very specific. Um, you know, like I said, learning how to hold the club so that it delivers the the face square at the right time, then gives you the opportunity. What we call go on offense or defense. So it goes gives you the opportunity to go on offense that you can start to create speed, uh, and you're not, you know, the 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 shots are not deteriorating as you swing faster or more in more sequencing or more disassociated. Um, because people lock their swing down, you know, to order, in order yeah. to minimize the effect of uh, bad club face at address or, you know, poor grip or whatever it might be. All right, everyone, just a quick break in the episode to thank FlightScope Golf for sponsoring this episode. FlightScope Golf is one of the premier launch monitor companies in golf and really is the premier company when it comes to affordable and accurate equipment for the everyday club player. With the FlightScope Mevo and indeed the Mevo Plus, you can purchase a launch monitor to suit exactly what your needs are in terms of your golfing progress right now. And with the Mevo Plus, you actually have the ability to add on packages like impact location, different data parameters as you go and as your needs change as a player. There's no annual fee either, so there's no hidden charges. You just pay up front and you get your product straight away. 
And if you'd like to avail of a 5% discount of any FlightScope product, simply use the link in the description or the link on my bio website, Instagram bio on the social media and add SMG flight at checkout. So that's SMG flight at checkout to get that 5% discount. And again, what we really want in practice and learning is feedback. This gives you feedback at a very affordable price. So back to the episode. Yeah, I really like the concept of offense and defense in terms of what's happening. I think if most club players were probably honest with themselves, they start off in a very, very defensive mode is trying not to make mistakes. And then, you know, nearly when they've hit a good shot or had a good hold, then it switches to a little bit. Okay, well, I can do this stuff. Uh, I'm going to go on offense or nearly sometimes when it's that bad, you just, as you said, and Mike said, nearly after four or five holes, you just end up going, you know what, fuck it. <laughs> Whatever happens, happens. And, you know, I just start swinging away and, and it all starts to work out, so, so to speak. Sorry, go on, so yeah. finish, finish that one. Uh, almost everybody that does, you know, the stack system or or tries to get longer, they generally will hit it straighter, right? Yeah. So in order to hit it further, you need more energy producing things, and mm-hmm. you need to accumulate or create and accumulate and send energy through the body and the the you know the the golf swing is a multiplier of energy, right? And if you got restrictions, you're not going to gain speed, right? And so, you know, some people doing the speed sticks or you know stack long drive, whatever it might be, they, they, in my experience, when people get faster, they usually hit it straighter as well. And so it's kind of interesting that it enhances the, unless it hurts them, of course. So, yeah. so they, they either free up their joints, gain disassociation, or they continue to be restricted and get hurt. So one of those two pathways. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the only thing I have when I'm looking at stack or any of those speed training systems is you, you kind of need to be prepped, especially as you're a club golfer before you start on those journeys um, if you're a junior it's okay but you kind of just need to be careful in terms of that they're great really really helpful but again just need to be careful um talk about the club player getting better probably one of the biggest <laughs> advancements of the last like definitely two years or three years has been ai and in terms of using it in 3d technology and you've played a prominent role through your association with sports box ai just a couple of queries regarding this area so firstly um if one of the club golfers is listening to this and they go, you know what, I'm really interested. I'm going to about to buy sports box. I'm going to use it. Should they learn anything before they jump on the app? Uh, and how would they use it in the best possible way to improve their game? Well, I think ideally, uh, you know, it's like buying a, a track man or um, force plates and things like this. It's still to some degree a coach's tool. Mm-hmm. But we're working very hard to make it um, usable. So it's honestly, it's better to 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 start off with a coach, okay, and work out what the the best numbers are to to pay attention to. You know, it's like what's the low hanging fruit? Where's the biggest bang for the buck? And things like this. Um, yeah, we're going to be having you know certain things coming through the app, which. Will make it a little bit more consumer friendly, but right now it's it's more of a coach tool, and mm-hmm. so the the way that most people are using it is they're taking a lesson, and then the coach is setting up some goals for them to work towards, and yeah. so that would be the ideal situation is that you then, you know, you're going to hit balls with feedback, right? And so, you know, whether we like it or not, we've always been biomechanists and movement mm-hmm. coaches, because if we tell someone to shift more to the right or go to the left earlier or turn more, I mean, it's effectively biomechanics, right? Yeah. And so when when they're taking their lesson, there's definitely a way that um, they can, uh, you know, uh, think about the things that they're working on. And then there's definitely a number to associate with that. And it does in itself in the app. It does give you good feedback and the data parameters. So if you, you know, if you're a club player and you go hit a seven iron or a driver, you plug in that data. And then you can look at the actual data parameters and it will go green or red depending on where you should be. So it does give you some guidelines where you can start learning a little bit. But again, as you said, having information is one thing. Using that in the proper way or how to effectively use that is something else. I, I think I think with TrackMan, with more launch monitors, with more kind of affordable launch monitors, people are getting au fait with that data. So it's not too much of a leap that they could be a little yeah, bit better I think, with the uh... stuff. Well, I think Sportsbox has done a really good job, you know, creating the tiles. You can choose yeah. what you see. Um, additionally, you know, I mean, we're talking about all sorts of different consumers, right? I think when, um, mm-hmm. you know, when we talk about uh, a club golfer, 
they're not all built the same, right? I mean, I live in yeah. New York, and they are used to dealing with numbers. You know, there's a lot of people work in the in the financial business, and so they're not afraid of the numbers. Um, you know, you could also have somebody who's you know extremely feel oriented, and so the technology has to attract the person to it that is potentially going to make the most of it as well. It's not mm -hmm. probably for every single person. Yeah. Um, but if you are the type of person that is attracted to technology and if you're going to use uh, sports box now, you'll still be a early adopter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's definitely tools within it where you can compare. So for example, you could be playing really well this week and, you know, you go ahead and hit some drives some wedges and some middle irons and something. And so you've got yourself, uh, so your own best practice. And in that regard, um, without making any changes, you've got a tremendously important tool that you can then go back to in the, in the, in the future. Um, or, and, you know, so basically there's a comparing function. Um, I mean, this is effectively a homemade version of, you know, what Bryson did when, when he won the US Open is Sportsbox yes. recorded the swing for three weeks in conjunction with, um, you know, the launch monitor information. Mm -hmm. And they could, you know, very precisely identify, you know, when his ball did something that he didn't want it to do these were the numbers that he should look at. And, you know, there's a way to do that. You know, if you're not playing very well, go back and look at what you were doing well. You know, we have a whole lot of uh, videos on, uh, on, on YouTube. You know, Mike and I have made some about understanding, you know, what kind of variables affect the swing direction, the face, you know, contact quality, things like this. And so, you know, a person can go back and, um, you know, maybe compare their, their good and bad and mm -hmm. and try and work out what what um what the difference is and work towards the solution so there's different ways to do it um but you know like many things there's some amount of education but again like i said there's some there's some very nerdy people out there who possibly like bryce and don't like to listen all that much to different teachers and they prefer to look at the data i actually heard him say that he's like just give me yeah. the data i don't want to i don't want to listen to anything <laughs> <laughs> and um you know, and so consequently, that it, it's going to be a, a a subset of all club golfers that will actually appreciate investigating themselves, uh, yeah. and finding some solutions themselves, and hanging out with their friends and doing the same thing. So I think, you know, it might not be for everybody. You know, for the general population who, you know, anytime I write uh, uh, something for a golf magazine, it's like, yeah, that's really good, but can you make it like completely? idiot proof that only the most you know simple golfers can understand it you you're not really serving the intelligent you know exploration sort of minded golfers really and that's a lot of the people that i teach are kind of more like that mindset that i'll give them much longer form videos and yeah. you know in-depth understandings of how things work because you know grip it like there's a bird in your hand and don't think of anything it, you know that's that's okay. You can do that if it works, great. But you know, you might need to do two or three things in conjunction with each other to to make you play better. And that that's a decision that each you know golfer has to make as to what are they willing to do to to learn about themselves and about their golf to get better, right? And you know, bird in the hand is good for someone. Yeah, I think a lot of that really boils down to the coach, or it's the role of the coach, so to speak, when you get that different person in front of you. So I might have players that come on the lesson tee and, and want the 3D system on them. They like the wiring, they like the geeking numbers, you know, they like getting into the detail, into the weeds. And then the very next lesson, I could have a player who doesn't want any of that, wants an external image or a queuing system or wants to feel more things, get a sensation of that. And that's absolutely fine. And it's up to us to be more of a chameleon in terms of suiting us to the player rather than the other way around. And when you're talking about Sportsbox, I think just mentioning there what a really good idea is, hey, whatever app you're using, if you do have that really good round on the golf course, get to the range afterwards and put your swing on camera, put it into an app, whatever the case may be, whatever you're using, so you have a bit of a record of it, right? So if I go out and play really, really well tomorrow, I hit the ball great, I want to know what I was doing when I hit the ball great. doesn't matter whether it's right, wrong, or different in the face of other people's opinions. Just what do I need to do to hit the ball really well? And I think that's really important. So if you do have a great game of golf, try and get to the range afterwards. Get that data. It's, it's precious stuff, believe me. Um, when talking about Sportsbox, the, the one critique about 3D apps right now, 
has been their accuracy and that really goes back to the fact that there's only in most instances one camera on you now i know sportsbox and other apps or other companies excuse me now have studio versions where you can have multiple cameras on you but there is that critique about okay well there's only one camera so there's going to be occlusion or i'm not going to be able to see everything do you think that's a fair critique of the system right now or do you think as it goes and the ai develops it's getting more accurate all the time and obviously, even in that, even in the discussion of accuracy, there is the accuracy of the actual data and the accuracy of representing what the player actually does. So what I mean by that is a player on a golf course hitting a seven iron that doesn't know they're on camera will probably be a lot more accurate than a player in a very kind of, a, let's say, a studio boxed in and with all the wires on them. So in terms of the overall question, you know, how accurate do you think the 3D apps are right now? And do you think it'll constantly develop or what's your viewpoint on that critique? Well, uh, it's a unanswerable question in some ways. In okay. the, you know, uh, you know, it, it's it's reasonable that you can go to a lab, you know, make an appointment, you know, walk through New York City with your clubs and go to the lab and, you know, put a suit on and just swing naturally, whatever, you know. So there's that sort of really extreme version of like a lab yeah. where, you know, maybe they can connect some uh, sensors under your skin, you know, dig some holes, put it on the bones. Cause you know, the muscles are actually a little bit of a problem and from an accuracy standpoint. And so there's that ultimate accuracy. Right. And yeah. so, which we'll never get. Right. No, but you know, if you're going to, if we're going to have a discussion it's sort of have to set up the parameters of the discussion. Yeah. hundred percent. Right? So what's the scope of the discussion is, the opposite is no technology at all, right? You're mm -hmm. just eyeballing it. Um, yeah. And so somewhere in there is all possible accuracy measurements, right? You know, you sort of quickly glanced at a swing as you were walking by. That's something, right? And so that's like mm -hmm. the one end of the spectrum. And, you know, when people ask me my opinion on a swing as I walk past, they never accuse me of having the wrong camera angle, by the way. I'm always curious about that one. <laughs> they really do say well your eyes your eyes weren't your eyes weren't down the line on that one no they weren't i wasn't <laughs> kneeling down you know in, in the hand <laughs> yeah but then at the same time when i make a video they uh, they're not, no i mean obviously if you're gonna That's, i've never just, ever thought about it that way i've honestly never thought about that perspective right. like no pun intended that's brilliant I love so that. okay so we got this incredibly wide spectrum of all possible accuracy True. uh and i would say at the eyeball it end of the spectrum you know, we have a lot of experience looking at videos and 3D and what have you. And so I would say that technology has trained our eyes over time, right? So I find that when I use technology, I see things better eventually. Um, so, you know, you could have trained or untrained eyes, right? I and mean, when you say to someone, you know, people come in and they have a lesson, they're like, you know, all these pros, they swing the same, you know? And, um, I'm like, well, that might not entirely be true. You know, here's uh, Bubba Watson and here's Matt Kuchar. You know, not quite. Oh, no. Wow, look at that. I never saw that. They, they look the same to me, you know? And so you go, okay, fine. So you can have trained or untrained eyes. Uh, you know, I've got pretty trained eyes. I've probably seen, you know, more swing videos than almost any other human alive having made a lot. And then putting them on the computer was like one of the greatest uh, educational things I could have done. And so now I can remember all these different swings, right? Without... Mm -hmm trying to it's kind of interesting so then you got your trained eyes and now okay fine so we move into you know launch monitors like can you see face to path no i can't so that's so we need to use technology can you see sway gap or lift timing or you know whatever that's nah, pretty hard to be consistent at right and so you know we're starting to move into utility right so there's probably some things that you can't see with your eyes that you want to start using technology to see, you know, ground reaction force is another example, right? So, you know, when we're comparing accuracy, the question is, what are we talking about? So when I hear people talk about accuracy, I'm, I feel like, you know, that's not accurate. Therefore, I'm going to keep using my eyes. So which is probably not a very good comparison. So I would say that we're significantly, you know, more accurate than a, even an experienced set of eyes. So, okay. so we're moving into probably makes sense to use something, right? Yes. So then we're in amongst the weeds and we've got, like I said, we've got this crazy extreme example of, uh, you know, you go to the lab, 
they put sensors into your skin and measure your muscle, you know, what have you. They can't really put sensors in your brain and understand why you chose to swing like that. So you admit, well, you stayed down uh, too long on that one, according to the data. Well, I was trying to hit a low shot. So, oh, didn't know that. So, you know, you sort of get into, you know, where Mark Ball investigates a lot is, you know, sort of, you know, the the mental and physical kind of relationships of concept and intent and things like this. Yeah. So then we go, okay, so how, how about, uh, you know, you've looked at probably some 3D systems, which were inertial. So they had, you know, three degrees of freedom, but not six. So, so there's, it's possible to measure rotations, you know, so something like the pelvis would be pelvis turn, mm-hmm. side bend and forward and backward bend. Um, but it didn't measure translation right. But that yeah. those kind of systems were actually pretty expensive for what for three degrees of freedom. And you know, I found it very difficult to understand. You know, so for example, if you're looking at something like uh, you know pelvic side bend, yeah. I don't know if it was not side bending because it was, you know, moving side to side, or you know, too much sway, for example, caused yeah. the tilt, or was it just someone causing too much tilt? And so those numbers uh, kind of goes back to, you know, what I said, it's kind of abstract in that it's not very close to the outcome and it's sort of incomplete information. So we go, okay, three degrees of freedom is probably not ideal in my opinion, mm-hmm. because if we say, well, we're using technology, you know, for me personally, I'm using technology to help me make decisions. Am I seeing what I think I see? So therefore, obviously we need some level of confidence that the, the data is accurate and consistent. And, you know, is it helping me to learn, you know, the relationship between these numbers, you know, so basically just using a, you know, 3D system is very beneficial. So, so I'd go, okay, so six degrees of freedom, we're looking at, you know, a much more elaborate sort of setup in terms of, you know, you're putting on wires or, you know, balls or whatever it might be. Yeah. And that, you know, obviously limits you to a fixed location. So, so we go, okay. You know, upside, possibly better accuracy. You know, there's a calibration component to it, which says, okay, here's where your joints are and what have you. And so, you know, the calibration um, is is an upside of a, you know, fixed location. So relative to zero, uh, I would say that would be, have the chance to be more accurate. But to answer your question after 12 minutes, um, you know, the AI component of it yeah. is it's not as if there is one camera, right? It's like there are multiple cameras. And so, you know, I was present for many of the early uh, AI trainings, machine learnings, and we would have, uh, I'm trying to think, we had like eight people sitting around with eight different cameras. But then internally, I think they had multiple, you know, different camera systems. And early on, it was manual dig- digitization. So, mm-hmm. so we'd have, uh, you know, 3D motion capture through AMM or another system. And so we'd have the absolute numbers, and then you'd have the, um, you know, the different camera angles that were then manually digitized to train the system. And okay. so then that was that would then be taken over by the AI, right? Okay. And so when you look at something like a sports box, you're not really looking at a one camera system. You're looking at like a one camera system that has been trained to see more through, you know, the, the, the machine learning and, and what have you. I don't want to be too technical because I'm not a, a technology person. No, but you're so, it very well. Yeah. But having been there and seen how it was, the data was basically fed into the system and, you know, knowing the people behind it are very accurate. I would say I look at it like, you know, Phil calls it a magic camera. And this magic camera basically is magic because it's almost like, you know, that Mac O'Grady would always talk about how, you know, the ideal of the camera moved with the swing, right? And so you're always yeah. in the right plane. And, you know, it kind of does, to be honest. And you can see that from different angles and what have you. And so, you know, interestingly, the the very first swing that we were seeing numbers with uh, was was Bryson's. And interestingly, the most accurate number early on was the trail arm uh, flexion extension. And the arm would disappear behind the body, right? 
So we so you'd have, you'd have occlusion, but yeah. we'd have occlusion, but the numbers were perfect, right? So very first, like I said, the very first sort of set of numbers that we were like, oh my god, that really is cool, was Bryson's occluded arm being exactly the same numbers as the AMM system that we had a, a data set from. And so, you know, I think when you start to get into this, it is very easy to think that we know what we're talking about. But to be honest, I, I don't. Um, but I think there is a really, uh, there's a lot more technology behind it. And we have, a, like I said, a very great set of engineers and thinkers behind it. But the the way that the data was originally, you know, calibrated and the, the systems were trained, um, make it like there's multiple cameras is really my answer. Um, so now from a consistency standpoint, um, you know, one of the lessons that we learned from, uh, you know, these three weeks, four weeks with Bryson when he won the US Open was that the, the data is extremely consistent, right? So if you have somebody like Bryson who's swinging pretty much close to the same every single time, you could start to compare your data to the reality, right? Which he is, he is a very consistent golfer. And so that that's a very important component that assists uh, teachers and, and potentially consumers using the technology is, you know, as long as it's consistent, you can use it, right? And so we know that there's a difference between, uh, you know, the way a foresight works and the way a trackman works. They measure in a different way mm -hmm. from a different angle, a different time. And you sort of accept that there's a couple of miles an hour, maybe club head speed difference or the path is a degree different here or there. And you just sort of accept that they do it differently, right? And so now we're looking at 3D motion capture systems and saying, well, how useful is it to have a motion capture system that you can just pull out your phone and you've got consistent information? Um, but the cost is you don't have those 20 minutes to potentially calibrate and this and that. So what we see, and there's extensive work done internally, we have a very high... Uh, conscientious do the right thing kind of ness to the company and you know they're consistently testing better ways to do it and this and that and you know so the zero is going to be different potentially right so if you say like the way we measure pelvis way mm -hmm. um it zeroes out when the club starts to move and now obviously we know that um some people they bump their pelvis to the to the to the right before the club moves Mm -hmm. So the zero isn't exactly zero, right? And so, but you know, if you know that, if you listen, and and if you understand, like I said, between foresight and trackman, you know there's a difference. So you don't expect the same number. Yeah, um, that's true. But, but that doesn't mean to say it's not useful, right? And so, um, so the the utility of it then becomes a really important thing. So, so the curves in our experience will be very similar, but the the absolute number might be different might be you know one or two degrees different might be you know some degrees of an inch difference but it will consistently be in the same direction in the, in terms of sports box i don't know about other systems so for example if you know if, if sports box measures sway for example as a lower number which it should mm -hmm. then you know it's consistently lower it's not like one time it's higher one time it's lower yeah, yeah. if it measures you know rotation slightly low then it's always slightly low, if that makes sense. And so that actually yeah. from a you know usability standpoint is is a very important piece. So then it comes back to you know utility. So you know I'll stand or I'll sit here and say I think it's extremely useful that you can get your phone out, film a swing. Somebody may not even know that they're being filmed. Um, and you've got this data set which is consistent, has been proven at the highest level, um, and is being used more and more on tour by tour coaches and what have you who, you know, are under a lot of pressure to get results and yet they're still, you know, using it. So it's sort of battle tested. Um, so that's, so that's the choice you make, you know, and, and then you can, like I said, go and test it on the golf course and what have you. So, so in those regards, I think it's, um, it's a, it becomes a question of absolute uh, accuracy versus, you know, utility. I think, um, which is a really important thing. I think, you know, there's, and the AI continues to learn, right? And there's more swings been taken in sport, sports box motion capture than any other system in history. And so the data set is, is really big and it's, it's very useful. And, 
you know, as a consequence, as we move forward with the integration with um, Foresight, you know, with the combination of the, you know, the club delivery numbers, the, the ball flight numbers, and the movement numbers, and the gigantic data set that is in place, it's going to start to become much more useful than somebody hitting on an electromagnetic system, you know, in a bay that is not connected to any kind of launch monitor, right? It's kind of hard to make sense of that information. So long answer. But it's <laughs> important long to answers, hear it. That, no, I 100% want you to talk about that and, and get into detail because it changes the perspective, you know, where people might have the opinion, okay, it's only one camera, but when you hear your information on it, it's okay. Well, it is one camera at that point in time, but the research behind it involved multiple cameras, multiple people, multiple data, multiple, a lot of information. I think that's really important because it does, it changes the perspective of the information that's being supplied. And this isn't a critique of any 3D app whatsoever because I use them. So I have my full 3D system, the bull 3D system that I use. That's more a wired system. So that's done out in the grass deck for my long-term players. And then if I have a club player in front of me where I would need data really quickly, I'll use sports box or motion to coach in a really, really quick capacity. So I 100% get the utility. And I agree also on the other factor that, you know, we're very accepting the track man and let's say quad and flight scope measure at different perspectives, different times. You know, why wouldn't we have the same understanding of 3D data? As long as it's consistently accurate in terms of what it's doing, where it repeats itself, then as long as we know there's a slight differential, then we can use it in a functional capacity. Because like everything, you know, the data is one thing, but interpreting the data and using it in the correct way is probably the most important thing out of everything. It's no, it's it really is like, because again, it, it changes perspectives on things where you go, okay, well, it's not actually just one camera. There's a lot more to it. There was a lot of data went into this. I think that's important. And I'm not asking this in a, in a criti critical way of Sportsbox. I use it. So I have Sportsbox and I also have, a bull 3d with a paul hemis g4 system that i use also and so for the players that are more long-term development players i'll get out the and i'm out in the range on a grass deck so with the bull system and with the paul hemis i can do that but if i'm in a quick less with a club and i can just pick up my phone or my ipad and just do it very quickly i use it both ways so i i get a hundred percent what you mean by the utility of it and as you say i think it's a very valid point that you look everybody accepts the track man and foresight and flight scope measure different points different so why wouldn't we look at it the same way? It's just really, again, like everything, you got to get to know the data and be familiar with the data, and then you can use it in a functional capacity. Um, it, it, we're going to go on to the coaching <laughs> section side of things, and uh, I'm just going to move on to a question. Uh, I'm, glad very... I, I'm glad I kept it simple then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but again, sometimes, it, here's the thing. I think to answer <clears throat> questions accurately, you can't betray who you are and what you've gone through to learn that information. Right. I think if you gloss over it from what you've done, then you're kind of betraying the accuracy of what you're giving out information. And people are going to listen to this and what you say, they'll hear and they'll validate. And, you know, you got to represent yourself and your thoughts and your process and what you've, how you've traveled through this process to get here. I think that's, that's a very, very fair thing to do. So I have no problems with the, the, the answers being longer. All right, everyone. So that's end of part one for this episode. And I hope you're enjoying and learning so far. Well, as much as I did during the interview, and stay tuned for more insights into the world of golf with part two out next week.